So how many folks are DBAs in the house? It's exactly what I wanted to see. Because um, really the goal for today is, um, and I kind of have a slide on this in a second, but really is mostly all probably PowerShell pros. And what I want to kind of evangelize today is the capabilities that you can get out of PowerShell in the context of a DBA. And so you can take the tools and techniques that we're going to talk about today and maybe show them to your DBA and say, hey, listen, you can do this. All right? Because everything I want to show you today uh, comes from before I worked at Pure, I was an independent consultant for 12 years. Uh, and in 2016, well, pre-2016, I was the copy and paste PowerShell guy. Like, I'd Google the thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I think that's going to work, and copy and paste it, and it worked. Or not, right? And it screwed up a system. Uh, but right at that time when I was learning PowerShell, uh, DBA tools launched in 2016. Uh, and DBA tools, which we'll talk more about in detail today, is a PowerShell module that enabled me to be able to do things at scale, right? Which is probably a lesson most of you all already learned in your career, because you can write code to do a thing a lot faster than you can ever click a mouse to do a thing, right? And so that was able to make me, as an independent consultant, be able to scale and work on larger systems. And so what I have today is just a set of things that I would do in the field and in my customer sites to attack database problems, right, to solve very particular things. This isn't like a massive migration suite of, of things that we're going to go through, but really it's, it's the techniques and the tools that I use to do that stuff. Right. So let's get started. Uh, so I'm Anthony Innocentino. I'm a principal field solution architect at Pure Storage. My focus is SQL Server and cloud at Pure. I design really cool systems with our customers and break down a lot of technical barriers that they might run into uh, on our platforms building storage-based solutions. Uh, I have a bunch of contact information on here. The slides will be available for download. In fact, they're already on my GitHub repo at that location there. Uh, and also the code. Uh, today, or actually yesterday morning, I, have, I can't pitch a conference at another conference, but we picked the schedule for the AKV conference this morning. Uh, so that's going to be a fun thing that's going to announce tomorrow. So check that out. Uh, also, I'm a Pluralsight author. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about today I uh, have available for you on Pluralsight. This isn't a sales pitch. If you want, just hit me up for free, or hit me up and I'll give you a free trial access code to get into that content at Pluralsight. So who's used DBA tools before today? Okay, good chunk of y'all, good. Uh, for the rest of y'all, what it is, is a community-driven PowerShell module uh, written by a bunch of people that I've become friends with over the years collaborating on that project. It basically takes anything that you can do inside of SQL Server Management Studio and implements that inside of PowerShell. That's really the goal of the project. And so the idea really is it's a CLI SSMS. Not gonna lie, I've been a DBA for a long time and it's getting to the point that I just go straight to PowerShell and my T-SQL skills are starting to get pretty rusty, right? Uh, because this is my go-to solution when I want to do something because you're gonna see we can do very powerful things in one line of code. We can do very powerful things at scale in one line of code and we'll talk about some of those scenarios today. So I already kind of let the cat out of the bag on this. I'm assuming y'all know PowerShell. Is that a fair assumption, team? Yeah, okay. Man, that's a good, all right. it's like I saw into the future with that one, or came to PowerShell Summit. Uh, but does your DBA know PowerShell, right? The person that you're working with in your enterprise, in your data center, are they still doing things in a set-based way inside of T-SQL? Most likely, because that's their tool of choice, right? So hopefully they're like 2016, Anthony, and make that transition into this over time, right? Cool. And so that's really the goal for today, is to help you all understand this, but also help empower your, the rest of your team. And so we're going to talk about a bunch of different use cases today. Primarily, we're going to talk about how to build connections to instances, and also getting a lot of information. My build sequence is messed up. Hmm. One of the superpowers of DBA tools is this. I can back up a whole SQL server. I can back a whole, up a whole data center of SQL servers with one line of code. That sounds cool, right? Yeah. Dramatic pause. We're going to talk about a pretty hard thing that DBAs have to do. It um, becomes a blocker in some high performance scenarios, being able to take a database and rebalance that data across multiple data files and file groups. Who's done this? Anybody? Easy or hard? Well, now it's easy. 
right? Cool, we'll talk about that. Uh, who knows what an availability group is? Okay, an availability group is the ability for SQL Server to replicate data across multiple instances for HA and DR scenarios, okay? One of the things that's fantastic about SSMS is whoever built that wizard in SSMS, like, it's like they should get an Oscar for user interface design because you're performing a very complex task in a very uh, intuitive way when we're doing that. But doing that in code isn't that easy. And DBA tools attack that problem. We're gonna talk about how we can use that and why I'd wanna use that rather than doing it in the GUI, right? We're gonna talk a lot about these copy commandlets, uh, which is the ability for you to get a reference to an object and do something with it, which is gonna become very powerful when I wanna do things like synchronize objects or instance migrations. And last year, I did, or maybe it was the year before, I think it was the year before, uh, in the before times, uh, about deploying SQL servers automatically, or installing SQL server and also configuring them. Uh, who's used Pester before today? All right, yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about Pester and how we can leverage both the commandlets uh, to imperatively configure a platform, then also go back and make sure the platform is how we left it, right? Because who's deployed something in their data center and came back like a month later and something changed? and nobody told you. And you're like, why'd that change? Why is Mac stop one now, right? That kind of stuff. Cool. Uh, those are all the slides. I've never done this before where I'm do, I do all code, but let's get into it. So this is available on my GitHub repo. I'll put that out for everyone in a second. Uh, if you see me present before, I always use the same password. That's not my real password. But if you'd like to go uh, listen to an 80s song by Crowded House called Something So Strong, click on that link right there. Excellent. Uh, much to my coworker's chagrin, I'm going to be using Docker today. <laughs> uh, if you didn't know, you can deploy SQL Server in a container. And so what I'm going to do here is deploy SQL Server 22 in a container. A couple things I want to point out is you can inject configuration at runtime uh, when you start up a container for SQL Server. We're going to use that a couple times in this demo. And I'm also gonna use what's called a persistent volume, which is a way for me to store data external to the container such that the life cycle of the container and the life cycle of data are decoupled. Right, so I can delete the container, start up a new one, and my data's still there, right? Anyone use SQL Server in a container before today? All right, about a quarter of y'all. So let's go ahead and start that up. Oh, it's already in use. Somebody forgot to run the cleanup script. That's what I get for making fun of Mike. All right. Cool. So, all right, fingers crossed. This is gonna go a little better this time. All right. I do have a warning here. I'm running an ARM Mac. Uh, this is an Intel compiled or an x86 compiled container. There's some emulation occurring, uh, but this is actually faster than my Intel Mac. And it runs at like 88 degrees. All right, and we're gonna start a second container. So the very first thing I wanna do is talk about building a connection to an instance and what you can do with that object once you have it. And so I'm gonna log in as SA, please don't judge, all right? <laughs> but it's gonna make my life easier because you know it's just a presentation. So build that object up, and then I'm gonna go ahead and use connect DBA instance to connect to my object, or connect to my instance, to one of the containers that we just started up top. It's running on localhost. Now, this object I can reuse over and over and over again in my connection, so I don't have to go and build a credential every time and pass that in. So you can see that in an example here, is I'm gonna go get a listing of processes against the instance, and I'll just pass in that object back in, and it'll reuse that object over and over and over again. This is important because if you do certain things in uh, SQL Server, so for example, in SQL Server 22, you have the ability to take a snapshot inside the engine, but that requires a persistent connection. So if I came back and made a new connection, then it's gonna be two separate SPIDs inside the engine, which is gonna break the continuity of what I'm trying to do inside a SQL Server. So it will basically reuse that connection over and over and over again. And any connection that you make with DBA tools will have a program name that matches that. As we scroll back up, and you can see my connection on SPID 51 is up and running. So we're gonna reuse that over and over again to do certain things. Now, one of the things that's interesting 
who's worked with SMO before? Anybody work with SMO before? All right, like one of y'all. So SMO, or uh, SQL Server Management Objects, is the back end to SSMS. And that's actually the back end of DBA tools. So they're not going and re-implementing functionality. They're taking functionality that exists in this .NET library and implementing that for you. If there's a feature or function that doesn't exist, well, you can just build that object and do it on your own because those methods and properties are going to be hanging off of this object for you to work with, right? And so very simply, rather than just using get DBA database, I can just ask SMO for its listing of databases. Now, the formatting is slightly different and it's running off the side there. But the idea is you have the capacity to build custom things if you need to, if it's an unimplemented thing inside of DBA tools. And then you should go commit that to the repo and they might take that into the, into the project. Cool. Any questions or comments about the first one, team? Nope, oh, cool. Oftentimes I walk into an enterprise and I don't know what's there. Right? I have a listing of servers and I have to figure out what's going on in an environment, especially if I'm thinking about how I'm going to migrate a platform between data centers, between instances, things like that. And so what I wind up doing, especially when I migrate, uh, DBA Tools has an instance migration commandlet, which will scoop up everything and stick it on another instance. In my mind, that's the easy button, right, to be able to do all of that. But what's the first thing that I do when I think about migrating a platform between A and B is what can I leave behind? Because I don't want to bring that junk forward, right? And so I'll surgically figure out exactly what I want to bring to the next platform and bring just that. And so one of the things that I'll do is I'll use these commandlets to identify what's actually useful. Are there dead databases laying around that aren't getting used anymore? Has a job been failing for the last three years and nobody knew about it? Like that kind of stuff. Leave that behind and figure that out, which you don't, which you don't want to bring forward. And so you can build a very complex inventory mechanism just off of these commandlets because you can go through and get things like the actual instance configuration. You can get the server roles, the stuff that you'd be interested in to bring forward to that target platform, right? And we'll talk about how to use that with the set commandlets a little bit later. And so the typical one that I'll use the most, especially if I'm getting the size, like feel for the size of a platform, is get DBA database. So we'll get you a listing of databases across an instance or more than one instance. This parameter here doesn't take a SQL instance, it'll iterate on a set, right? So that could be many databases as well. So you can just feed this in an array list and it'll just march through that. And we'll see an example of that later on. You can see just system databases here. We're about to bring some real databases to the party now because, yeah, and one of the, this is what I call out right here in the notes. So when you go back and read this code later, like you'll have all the notes that I'm thinking about going through this. But this will become core to your migration technique when it comes to inventorying, but then also piping the output of what you want to bring into a set commandlet to create that thing on the target, right? Cool. All right. Let's go back to the future with Restore DBA Database. Probably the most use, used commandlet for me is this one here because I can take this individual commandlet and point it at a stack of databases and it'll restore all of the databases from that particular bucket of backups, right? That sounds pretty cool, right? Especially if you're doing something like building a DR strategy, right? But there's some performance stuff that you want to look at when building around that type of implementation and we'll talk about that today. When I'm working with customers, especially from a migration standpoint, in addition to the configuration, I've got to bring data to the party, right? And I talk to a lot of customers at Pure, SQL Server customers, that still in their mind think that when I have to migrate a server or a database between two servers, it's a size of data operation, right? If I have a terabyte database, I've got to move the terabyte between server A and server B, right? But people think that they have to do all of that in a window that's the downtime window. Like, why would you want to do that? We have like really cool restore techniques where you could like precede the data and then do the thing for a final cutover. And I was, I'm surprised a lot of folks are still get wrapped around the axle on that one. And so I want to talk about literally the way that I've migrated databases since 2016. And we're going to look at some more advanced scenarios on that. So this is a Docker container. And in that Docker container, I have a stack of backups that I've uh, put as accessible to my container. And simple enough, if I want to, I can just say restore DBA database and point at that stack of backups. 
and bring back those databases. And it's going to tell you exactly what it did. And then when I go run get DBA database again, I have my databases restored. And they're immediately online. So I just, this is just me seeding what we're going to do from a migration standpoint. Uh, those were not that small. It's kind of running off the side there. Let me do that again for Mike. About five gigs, six, almost six gigs. Yeah. So um, the bananas thing is I'm running SQL Server on Linux, which thinks it's Windows, inside of a Docker container that thinks it's an x86 container on an ARM processor. <laughs> and I'm still getting about a gigabyte a second throughput. This is actually faster than my one-year-old MacBook Pro but that's Intel-based. Yeah, that's like 87 levels of extraction there. Like some computer scientist's brain just exploded. So, but oftentimes I don't want to restore everything, right? And so I'm going to go ahead and build a sequence where I'm going to precede a restore on a target instance, come back, take a differential backup at cutover time, and move just the change blocks, right? And that's a technique that I've been using literally since 2016 to migrate SQL servers. And let me show you how I do that. So I'm going to build a little array list of the databases that I care about because I don't want to bring the system databases along in this party because I would have moved the configuration with the previous commandlets, right? And so I'm going to take a full backup of these databases. So let's walk through this. Backup DBA database for my instance, the set of databases that I care about, full with backup compression. I want them to land in that bucket right there, right? So when I take this backup, it's going to return an object that I care a lot about right now because in that object is going to be the backup set. And I can take that backup set and do something with it, right? So let's look inside that backup set. So inside of here has all the information about what just happened, specifically where the files live and if I restored them, where they would go on the target platform, right? And you can change that on the fly, but we're going to keep it simple for today. So with that object, I pipe that into restore DBA database on my other SQL Server instance that I started, that second container, passing in the SQL credential. Notice this is different. I have to auth to that server this time because I didn't create the small object that I did earlier with Connect DBA database. I'm going to leave the databases in no recovery, which will allow me to continue to restore other backups after the fact. Right, so this could be a terabyte that I'm doing right now, and then on Saturday night when I got my outage window, I'll bring the rest of the data. So I don't have to specify which databases I need to restore. I just pass the object in, and it does the right thing. Right? Super powerful technique there, because as a DBA, I'd have to go and code around that to make sure that the backup sequence that I needed to restore is what's there. And so I just have all of that here in that object. And so I leave the databases in recovery mode or restoring mode, which means now I can restore diffs or logs. This database is currently in simple recovery, so I have to use diffs, right? So I use the same exact technique, right? So at this point in time, I talk to the application owners. Maybe they stopped their workload or not. I think, you know, that's another conversation. But now I can take a differential backup using the same exact technique, right? So I'm going to take that, restore that object, or restore the databases, take the output, excuse me, take a backup of the databases, get that backup set in the diff backup object, and we'll use that same technique to migrate to systems. On the first instance, what I'll do is I'll offline it, restore the diffs on the target instance, and check my database's status, right? So at this point in time, that would have been the cutover. Right, this could be 10 databases, 100 databases, whatever it is. There's some you know, dusty nuances that you want to be concerned about with regards to how a database comes online, uh, but that's really a kind of an optimization. But that's literally how I migrated databases for the last five years, well, until I took a job where I wasn't doing this anymore, and I didn't have to like, wake up on Saturday at like 1 in the morning to do this work. Because right? who loves doing that? Anybody? All right. But yeah, super simple. Uh, I don't want to have real big complex solutions around that because what happens when you have complex things? We learned this yesterday in the keynote. Things break, right? Cool. All right, so I want to clean up from that. I'm going to offline, or I'm going to online that source database and kill that container. Any questions or comments around that team? Nope. Oh, cool. Awesome. 
I started at 11, right? Oh, I got to step on the gas. So lots of code. All I'm really doing here is getting a shared access signature from an Azure Blob container because everything that we talk, just talked about can work against SMB, S3, real files, and also Azure Blob containers. So all the backup and restore commandlets can do that. What I want to call out here is, I'm just going to real quickly build a credential, is I'm going to do something a little bit different uh, with regards to how to get access to the databases that are in a bucket of backups, right? So I previously took a whole bunch of backups and stuck them in this blob container, okay? Now one, that's over the internet, so there's latency involved. And two, uh, if I want to build a backup set for this stack of backups, how would I do that? Like, I don't have that object that I had a few minutes ago that I could just pipe into the restore DBA database, right? And so I have this stack of backups, and you can do this for both uh, file or object. In this case, we're doing it against an object store. Okay. So a bunch of these are in there. I think there's like 20 some odd objects in there. The way that I usually go about doing this is I will take a subset of these, because chances are if I'm trying to build a backup set, I don't need all of the databases ever. I need maybe like the last week or so. I had to up that to 14 because I think I took the backups about 10 days ago. And what I'm doing is I'm reducing the number of files that I need to operate on. So these are the backups from the last 14 days. Why would I want to do that? Anybody take a guess? So I'm going to take this data, right, because I don't know anything. I don't know what's inside these backups, right? It's just stuff. And I'm going to feed it into a command that's going to build the backup sequence for me. Right? But if, so if I narrow the amount of files, the backup files that I'm feeding into the commandlet, it's going to be faster. Right? Cool. All right, so let's go ahead and, so I'm going to take it from an object. I'm just going to pull off the file name. So it's just the URL there to the backup file. And this is bananas crazy when you do this. So within this set of backups, I have a couple of system databases. I have the two databases that I really care about, and that's what I'm scoping here on line 196. All right, so I'm going to run that. What's happening now is every, each one of those backup files, it's running restore database uh, with uh, restore header only so that it can figure out what the backup sequence is. Meaning when I say backup sequence, is it fulls, diffs, logs, the collection of logs, and building the right sequence to, act, to like, accurately restore the database. Right? Cool. And now I have that same object that we had a second ago when I ran the backup and I just spit it back out. And so now I can just take this code, point it at a stack of backups, and have a now a valid restore sequence, right? So if I go and do the same thing we did a few minutes ago, restore DBA database, and this one I'm only going to restore, I'm not actually going to restore the databases, but just show you the restored statements that are generated. I could restore them, of course. So I think this is fantastic. Why is this fantastic? Anybody have a DR plan? Right? Yeah, and so you could use this to rebuild these scripts for you automatically without knowing, like, because if, if you lose a database server with the backup history, this is the way, right? Cool. I uh, blogged about that, too, so you can check that out. So we do have time, 20 more minutes. Okay, so now we're going to bring balance to the force with invoke DBA uh, balance data files. Uh, back in 2015, I wrote this code by hand in SMO. It wasn't great, right? Like for each, for each, for each, for each. Don't comment about where my braces are. It was like a thing back then. And so you had to write all that code and iterate over that manually. What DBA tools did is made my life easier and did that for me. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work with that database that we've been working with. This is just a TPCH database. That's a couple gigs in size. I'm going to rip down that container because right now it had only one uh, volume for databases, and I'm going to add many more. So I'm going to have five in total. Cool. It's going to take a second for that instance to come back on. It's about to get colder in here. So connected the instance, let's see what we got. So there's my databases, they're still there, and they still are in a single file format. So a main data file and a log file. 
So since this is a Docker container, that wasn't a slight at my friend Mike, what I have to do is I have to go and I have to adjust some permissions inside of here. So that's what's happening. You can see the other, the original database directory is owned by MSSQL, but I have to set it the appropriate permissions for that. And I'm gonna add a bunch of data files and make sure everything is right. So that's what's all happening here. So there you can see the additional data files are added. Now, due to the way that SQL Server allocates data when it is allocating structures, uh, when you create new things, uh, it won't start using these things. It uses a proportional fill alg algorithm, which will basically start creating hotspots across those files, right? And so you can see here, I know that's a tiny team, I apologize. There's nothing in the database files yet. I have to do something to balance that out, to reap the benefits of having multiple database or multiple physical volumes to support this workload. Right, and there's a whole bunch of good reasons why you would need multiple volumes. Hmm. So, from the gazillion lines of code that you saw a minute ago uh, on my blog from seven years ago, I can just do this. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna take the structures from that main database file, rebuild the indexes. So this is an intensive operation that you would do outside of production hours and balances those files or the, the, the data across those multiple files. When you see this finished in a second here, it's gonna be a little bit unbalanced because it doesn't deal with heaps, but non-clustered indexes and clustered indexes are fine. So once that, this takes about a minute, so. Well, that's rebuild. Any questions or comments, team? Anybody, no? It's like watching paint dry, grass grow, or verbose output. That's what we'll say today. It's like watching verbose output. What's up, sir? Yes. So the question is, is it possible to execute a parallel restore? This is the reason why. You have to do this to get to that point. Your database has to be spread across multiple volumes, and then you have to have multiple data files spread across multiple volumes. SQL Server, uh, for legacy reasons, for on a backup and a restore, allocates a single reader thread or writer thread per volume. So that's the unit of parallelism which is stinky because that means your configuration gets complex because the only way to scale is to add volumes. And that's why I added volumes there. Yeah, good question. Uh, I can talk about backup tuning all day, but I'm a little concerned about the clock. But if you want to get nerdy about that, that's my jam. Yep, cool. And so, let's go ahead and run that code again. You can see it's put data into four files, not quite evenly across those. And there's a little bit more left over in that main data file than I'd like but we talked about the reasons about why a second ago. So very cool stuff. Uh, that, for me, was always a big deal, um, especially as I talk to our customers uh, that have complex environments, because to get to the point where you can do a parallel restore, you have to do this, right? And, or, or parallel backups as well, so. Interesting, so let's go ahead and stop that database. Now I'm gonna build an availability group, so which, normally uh, is a lot of PowerShell uh, if you're using the native SQL Server modules. And so let's go ahead and do a couple of things here. I'm gonna create a Docker network because the Docker network will give me naming inside of the container runtime thingy uh, such that they can address each other by their actual names. And for an availability group, that matters. I'm gonna pass in some additional configuration to get that going. So in the parameters here, I'm just reusing the same database that we just restored and restructured. I'm gonna uh, tell it that it needs to be an AG, so that's what's happening on line 305 there. Did I run that code? Yeah, I ran that code. I think I ran that code. Docker PS, I did, all right. And then I'm gonna start my second AG replica. Like all kidding aside, I'm still blown away. I've been working with SQL Server and containers since 2017, and the fact that I just deployed two SQL Server instances like that is pretty amazing, right? And so when you compare that to provisioning a Windows VM to support this type of workload, which one's faster, right? Yeah. Cool. All right, so let's build some connections to both of those. And on that second instance, I have to clean up the permissions because that was a new container that was created. So, all right, again, one more time. Who's created an AG before today? Easy or hard? I mean, the wizard makes it look easy, right? But it's doing a lot of things. and so. In this case, since I'm using SQL Server on Linux, I'm gonna use certificate-based authentication. Everyone just cringed, right? Okay. 
Uh, if you ever built like a database mirror in a non-Active Directory environment, you had to do this before. You can also do this in AGs. And the value behind this actually is then you get authentication between your instances independent of the availability of your Active Directory, right? Cool. So we have to do a couple of things. We're gonna create some master keys. And in two lines of code, I'm gonna create a certificate. I'm gonna back up that certificate. And I'm going to take that certificate and restore it to the second instance, right? That's like 847 lines of T-SQL to do this. And then you have to manually copy the file between two instances. Because there's a real sneaky commandlet in here that I love that is probably undervalued. What the get DBA file will do on that source instance, SQL instance one, it'll read the contents of a file and give it to you in a variable. That's pretty cool, right? And so we're overloading that here because inside of that is just the cert, which is an ASCII representation of the certificate that I could store in here and then use that to restore that onto that secondary instance. Man, I forgot if I ran that code. Did I run that code? Certificate DBA file, I did. Certificate. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, the other thing I do when I build an availability group is this. Uh, I don't wanna start with like a three terabyte database and have something go wrong when I'm building the AG because it's gonna replicate the data between the two instances, right? So I'll create a little stub database, test DB whatever, and then use that to build the AG, and then I'll come back in and fold the real data in, because then I'll know the AG is healthy before I move on to the data seeding phase, right? So that's what's happening here. I'm gonna create a database, uh, and then take that database, make, and take a backup, a full backup and a log of that database to put it in full recovery mode. Uh, because when you put a database in full recovery mode at, as a new database, it's not in full recovery mode for real until you take a full and a log. And so that's what's happening here. I'm also backing up to null, which just throws the bits and the bytes out the window, never to be seen again. All right, don't do that in production, please. All right, and then I'm gonna create my AG. So it's like three or four steps, I think, that occurred there. I created the certificates, I moved them between the instances, I created the sub database, and so now I go and I create the availability group. And I just pass in the right parameters to do that thing. If this was a Windows box, uh, very simple, I changed the cluster type to Windows. I have, have one line before that that says new cluster, and then I have a Windows availability group with the same set of code. Okay? Any questions, sir? In the real world, not on your laptop, you know, running. I know, it's tough. Uh, but in the real world, how much time are you talking about? For an AG? Yeah. To build out an AG, you right. know, just given us you know, some... In an automated way, yeah. the best I've ever done is two minutes. Okay. <laughs> and it wasn't pure. Huh? Of course. <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to skip over that code because what I want to do here is I'm now I'm going to add the real database to the platform too. So this is a common thing that DBAs will have to do when they're reseeding an availability group on a failure. So it's the same pattern uh, to build as it is to reseed, to add the database back to the availability group. And so we already did that. So now that database is replicated across both instances on my laptop and available, right? So get DBA AG database on SQL 1, synchronized, uh, means a particular thing inside of an availability group. SQL 2, synchronized, that means that from a block standpoint, they're identical across the two replicas, right? All right, so just the two of us. We can make it you and I. Um, the copy commandlets, and, like, and I get like getting through like these simple things that I'm talking about, like when it came to like copy and the stuff that we talked about earlier. These are really powerful constructs because I can do something like copy the logins between two SQL Server instances or N SQL Server instances very easily. So let's go ahead and create a stack of logins and users, okay? And when I look at that across my availability group, now there's a disconnect between the two, right? The first one has all four logins, the second one doesn't have all four logins. I can't tell you how many times this has out, caused outages in production environments, right? Like four of y'all just nodded your heads, okay? Why? What's gonna happen if I fail over an application and the login's not there, right? So when I talk about high availability with customers, I say nobody cares if SQL Server's online. And everyone's like, huh? 
I'm like, what they care about is they can get access to the data, right? So it's on you to make sure that your systems can get access to the data. Nobody cares that you met your SLA as a DBA. What they care about is does the application actually work? And so something as simple as getting the logins between two instances is one of the things that I'd find I'd run into a lot in customer sites. Oh, that login's not there. This link server's not there. This job's not there. Those are very important things with regards to making sure that applications actually work because up until SQL Server 2022, this was on you to do this work. In SQL Server 22, they introduced a thing called contained AGs that does this for you, but how many of us are running production SQL Server 22 instances? Anybody? Right, exactly. So still a key technique that I would use out in the field. So yeah, it's going to see that those are both copied across the two. And then what happened behind the scenes is it made sure that the security identifier and the password are synchronized too. So it's actually the same user. You can't just go create a user on a target instance with the same name and password. That's going to break things, right? So this does all the magic stuff to make sure the security identifiers match across your two instances. So you don't have to worry about that. There is a commandlet, let me scroll up, called Sync DBA Availability Group that the team put together it's about a year or two ago, I think, that does this for you and you can scope the objects that you want in scope. So for, so for example, if you just wanted to copy logins or you just wanted to copy link servers, it can do that. I've never, much like I don't use, and this isn't a slight against um, DBA tools, it's just a different philosophy and how things are migrated. I like to decide exactly what gets migrated. So I'll use a technique like this uh, to make sure that I know the things that I'm picking up and moving between the two instances, right? I know this is being recorded. I don't want to make Chrissy mad, all right? Cool. All right, so let's go ahead and do one more thing. Configuration is, is huge. Uh, we're going to talk about how I configure instances. I talked about it for two hours, uh, two or three summits ago, and doing that against multiple instances. So I told you earlier that you can execute nearly every single commandlet against multiple instances uh, with DBA tools. And so in this case, I'm going to use just one commandlet. I'm going to set uh, DBA max memory, and I'm going to install who is active. Um, when you're looking at the different configuration commandlets that are available, you can pretty much touch any configurable attribute inside the instance. So max stop, max memory, cost threshold for parallelism, default backup, any, anything. Right? But here I'm just going to show you what I would do in a platform that I deployed. Uh, I'm also a huge fan of having who is active on any instance. Who is active is a way for you to interrogate the platform or SQL Server from a performance standpoint. So those are just two configuration points that I put on every single system. But the more important thing I want to get into is this, is this pester test. So I wrote a test that takes the information from DBA tools commandlets and asks the instance, is it in a state that I want it to be in, right? And so what I have here is a pester test that goes through and executes a series of tests against the instance. And you can see there on line 15, I'm getting uh, test DBA max memory is going to return an object that tells me if I have the max uh, memory set to the recommended value. And so it'll do that calculation for me, right? And it'll interrogate that to make sure that the max value should be the recommended value. Now that's uh, a member variable that comes off of that object that I can just interrogate. So it's not a discrete value. I can get the discrete value if I want to, but that's going to be different for each instance based on the amount of memory it has in the instance, right? So I can't statically allocate or statically define what I want here for that. Similarly, for things like MaxDop, I can make that settings change as well. And in newer versions of SQL Server, have the ability to differentiate between the instance's DOP and an individual database's DOP. So I'm handling that case here, both the instance level DOP and the uh, database level DOP. Uh, if you're not a DBA, what DOP is, is the number of threads that'll get executed for an individual process when you start a task, right? And sometimes you want that to be a lot, and sometimes you don't want that to be a lot. And it depends on the, the physical topology of the CPUs in your system, okay? But this pattern of 
set some config, test some config is a pattern that I use day in and day out when I was deploying systems. Because I'd deploy stuff at a customer site and I'd leave for three months, right? Because I was a consultant and I'd come back, I'd run that again and be like, hey, what changed, right? Because then I would know why I think, what changed from the way that I left it. So, who used, yeah, I said use Pester, but half y'all said use, who used Pester, so. And when you run Pester, you get this nice output, and green is good, red is bad. That'll tell you it'll go through, and it's checking that the max memory settings should be that value, 3290 for this particular instance, checks the DOP against the NUMA topology of the physical system, that's SQL Server 1, that's SQL Server 2, right? It's like I do this against N number of SQL servers in a platform and get the information that I want, right? Cool. So that is a wrap for the, any questions or comments around that team? Good? Anybody gonna go do this when they get back to work? I think so, yeah? Awesome. Cool. All right, so we covered a lot in a short amount of time. We learn how that connection object can become very valuable when I'm working with that instance, right? And being able to interrogate that for information. Who's gonna go talk to the DBAs about this when they go back to work on Monday, right? It's the way to go. Uh, I, don't, I can't emphasize it anymore. When you get into a more advanced data management techniques, you're definitely gonna be using that. Building availability groups and also configuring platforms, right? I want to give a shout out to the DBA Tools team. If you haven't met these folks, uh, they changed the way that DBAs operate on platforms. They did it for me. Uh, so they wrote a book uh, last year that goes through kind of the full suite of all of the different ways that you can leverage DBA Tools in very practical ways. Uh, so big shout out to them. Give them some love on Twitter or buy a book for them. Uh, but I appreciate y'all spending some time to me with me today. So if you have any questions or comments, I'll be around for the rest of the week or we can open it up for questions or comments now for the next couple minutes, team. What's up? Yes, and I actually experiment with, with that because uh, PowerShell DSC makes me go straight to bourbon, right? <laughs> so <laughs> there is a session on DSC, I think today. Uh, so they probably have made it better since I had to deal with it. So what will happen is um, in the Pester test, and I haven't tested this on Pester 5, I've tested it on Pester 4. Oh, and the question was, um, can I use this to set configuration, not just test configuration? So what will happen when a test fails, it'll throw an error, and you can interrogate for the error, and then you have to handle as an exception in your code the apply, right? So you go from test, you'd have to handle the exception, and then you can use set DBA max memory uh, when you catch that exception, right? That was how it worked on four. I, have to ch I haven't implemented that into Pester 5 yet. So, but good question. What's up? So the question is, how do I decide what to leave behind when I'm doing a migration? Uh, honestly, it's, you're gonna have to put your detective hat on and figure it out. Um, with the dead database, it's hard. It's really hard to determine. One of the easiest ways is to offline the database and find out who screams. After you've looked at the usage statistics of the database to determine if it's actually not being used. Uh, logins are pretty easy because you can see who's not logged in. Uh, link servers are always going to be buried bodies because some piece of code is going to run three months from now and need a link server. Uh, so that's always a tough one. And then jobs. Jobs are usually the ones that I'm, I'm real heavy handed about that I want to leave behind because that's application code that if I can kill simplifies the platform because I don't people are gonna look at it and think that it's important, and it might not be. Uh, so you'll usually, I usually leave a heavy hand on that one about leaving those behind. So, answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Awesome, well thank you all for coming.